Hi everyone, it's Paul at the Garland County Library, and I'm here again with another episode, installment in our Bird in a Book series featuring our local Garland County Audubon Society rep and avid birder, Jerry Butler. And he's here today to interview a special guest, Mitchell Pruitt, who once completed an Arkansas big year when he was only in his teens. But uh, Mr. Butler will give him a more formal introduction here later on in the program. But first, I want to welcome Jerry Butler. Welcome once again. again. Hi, Paul. Good to be with you again. And it's good to be here to talk about a book and a bird. A while ago, when I was talking about the book and the bird, I said, I want to talk about the big bird. I meant the big year, but this is not Sesame Street. We're not talking about the big bird. We're talking about the big year. And so uh, we'll get right started and uh, we'll talk about the book, The Big Year. Um, the Big Year is a, a book that was subtitled A Tale of Man, Nature, and a Foul Obsession by Mark Bosmick. And um, we're going to be talking about the book and we're going to be talking about the movie a little bit uh, too uh, because uh, The Big Year is... It was made into a, a movie, and actually probably more people have seen the movie than have read the book. But first we'll look at the book, and then we'll look at the movie, and then we'll look at uh, the birders in the story, and we'll look at the concept of a big year, and we'll have a visit with our guest, and he's going to tell us about a very special bird, and at the end we'll talk about what's coming up in the book and a bird series. Okay, let's talk about it. But before we talk directly about it, I want to tell you a little story. Um, last time we met, uh, we were talking about the ivory bill woodpecker. And uh, I left the library and came straight home. And when I came to my home, I had these three large boxes that were sitting on my doorstep. And I was anxious to open them. And when I opened them, um, I found that they were from a friend of mine who had watched the program and had heard about the program. And uh, he had seen the Ivory Bill Woodpecker. His name is Dean Herleman, and he lives in Burlington, Iowa. And Dean is a woodcarver and a poet. And what he carves is extinct birds. And this is a picture of him carving a great auk. The great auk became extinct in the late 1800s when a fisherman killed the very last one and stepped on its egg and squashed it. And he has written and carved, written about that auk and carved it on several occasions. And his, uh, his poetry has just been published in a book called Nobody Sees Them But Me. And if I can talk the library into getting a copy of his poetry books, I'm going to try to get them in the library, and maybe you can read them. Because he's a, he's a good poet as well as a good carver. But he carves other extinct birds too. And he uh, gives these birds that he carves to uh, libraries and museums and nature centers because there are no other way that people can see these birds. And uh, he gave us a carving of a Carolina parakeet and a passenger pigeon. And these are life-size carvings and they're painted uh, just like the bird that's extinct. And, uh, but mostly he was interested in the bird that he gave us. Uh, these are two birds. He carved a ivory-billed woodpecker, and then for comparison, he carved a pileated woodpecker. And we have now put them on display in the library, and you can come up here and you can see them and, uh, and read the story about Dean Herleman, the carver, and this uh, remarkable bird. I just thought I would share that with you because that's uh, Herleman was watching this program just like you when he decided to uh, to make this donation of 
these extinct birds. But let's go right on to our topic of the day, The Big Year. The Big Year is a book. This uh, book, The Big Year, uh, the book itself was actually very successful. It reached bestseller status on the New York Times bestseller list. And uh, I read the book uh, shortly after it was out, and I really enjoyed it. It's a book that's filled with with humor and a lot of good information about birds. And it introduced to me the notion of the big year. And the movie by the same title, uh, The Big Year, uh, was also told the same story. It was as a as a movie, it was really not as successful as the book was. The movie cost $41 million to uh, produce, mainly, I think, because they had some actors that they paid a lot of money uh, because it doesn't seem to me that uh, technically it should have been that expensive. And its receipts were only $7.1 million the first year. But I believe the book, the movie has had a staying power and it's been seen frequently since then. And um, you can check out the movie or the book here at the library and watch it if you haven't already seen it. I hope many of you have seen it in preparation for today's uh, meeting. And uh, Paul's now going to show us a little clip or a trailer that comes from the movie that'll tell you a little bit about what the story, the big year is about. I love working with my two co-stars in our new movie, The Big Year. The incredibly talented Mr. Jack Black. And of course, the very funny Mr. Luke Wilson. Sorry, Luke Owen, everybody. Big fan, love it. There is going to be major fallout in a few hours. Nuclear fallout. Bird fallout. Have you ever wondered what killed your marriage to Steph in 03? First of all, I was married to Bridget in 03. January 1st, I'm out of here. You realize the phase after retirement looks a little bit like this? You quit school, you quit work. Yeah. Great talking to you. I just want to do something big, you know? We need a little adventure. You're doing a big year. A year to do all the things we never could. <laughs> no. You think they'd be exhausted by now? Race to the bottom? They're turning their quest. They're man deer. If they ever stop competing, they die. Into the ultimate competition. Yeah! This is my year. I'm going to take my mark. <laughs> Can't miss the flight. There's not another one for a week. Hey! It sucks for him. Yeah. Cooking? Yeah. From the director of The Devil Wears Prada and Marley and Me. <laughs> One of us has to beat this SOB. <laughs> when it comes to comedy. Did you just do a victory dance? No. <laughs> Maybe. Yes, I did. Go big or go home. You bought me drinks and got what you wanted. Uh, really? You don't want to know. Steve Martin, Jack Black, Owen Wilson. Most people wake up one day and realize they didn't do everything they wanted to do. Am I not Zeta? Are you asking me as a therapist or as a wife? Which one is cheaper? This is incredible, isn't it? Unless there's a freak blizzard. I shouldn't have said there's going to be a freak blizzard. I jinxed it. The big year. Hey, yeah. Well, that gives you an idea of what the movie is about. If you you didn't get to see it, or even if you did, it's a good reminder. Um, the the story of the big year is a true story and they're real people. And um, the movie sort of fictionalized it just a little bit, but um, it's, it really happened. There really is a big year and the characters that are portrayed or their names are been changed, but they are real people. And so uh, uh, in the movie, um, Steve Martin and Jack Black and Owen Wilson 
play the real person of Kans, uh, Sandy Komoto. Sandy Komoto is a is a wealthy man. He is a roofer, and he's a grandpa to be, and he uh, could do a big year. Although it created some family problems for him, because uh, doing a big year is very time consuming. And if you do one for the whole United States or North America, it's a very expensive proposition and only the wealthy people can do it. Jack Black is a, another person who's trying to do a big year. And it's, uh, he's the real Greg Miller. And he's a computer guy. Actually, I identified more with Jack Black because he's sort of an ordinary guy who's just uh, really interested in big uh, uh, birds. And um, he had a good ear. He could hear birds and recognize them by the ear as well as sight. And um, he really had to scrape. And it actually the story of the big year took place in uh, in 1999 and you remember that in 1999 everybody was worried about when we change over to the year uh, 2000 if all of our computers were going to go haywire and uh, Jack Black was needed by his employer to do the work getting ready for the change of the millennium and so he had a double task to try to do a big year and, and hold a job and finance it all. He ends up borrowing money from his father. And yeah. then the third character is played by Owen Wilson, who is the real Al Levitin. And Al Levitin was the record holder for the big year. And he was a chemical uh executive and he was very wealthy uh, and it created a lot of problems for he and his uh, wife at the time. Now let's go on and and look at uh, look at the, the notion of the movie. Uh, this is a quotation I like from Roger Ebert, the uh, distinguished film critic. He said, there's some great photo photography here. I wish there had been more. I think I may have seen Jack Black falling down enough for this lifetime. The big year is getting the enthusiastic support of the Audubon Society and has an innocence and charm that will make it appealing for families, especially those who have had enough whales and dolphins for the year. I, I sort of agree with uh, Ebert. The, the the book had enough comic elements, but they sort of exaggerated those comic elements in the movie. And uh, some good bird photography would have contributed to it. And um, so I think this his assessment of the of the movie is is pretty accurate. I might talk a little bit about what a big year is. A big year is a competitive enterprise in which a person attempts to see and document it more species of birds in a single year in a specific geological area. Now, in the book and in the movie, they were just looking in the continental United States and Alaska and uh, they were looking for birds and they had to start on January 1 of 2019 and end on December the 31st at midnight. And in the movie and the <clears throat> real life characters, uh, they see uh, 755 species. However, the foul obsession takes a tragic a toll on the personal life of Al Levitin. In the big year, these these are the rules, and I might get my guest for the day, Mitchell Pruitt, to correct me on this. These are sort of it. Is it only wild birds count? Uh, you can 
not count any captive birds. So if you go to a zoo and see some exotic bird from Africa, you can't count that one. And it's good if you have pics of a bird, if it's a rarity. If you see a house sparrow, of course, you don't have to document that. Nobody would doubt that you see a rarity. And part of a big year is is basically on an honor system. Um, but for the most part, if you have a rarity, if you photograph it or someone's with you, that helps you. You have to do it all in a calendar year and you have to do it in a prescribed geographical area. Is that about right, Mitchell? Yep, that's about right. Okay, I, I read an interesting uh, essay today uh, that was written by Roger Torrey Peterson. He was doing a big year trying to see as many pe birds in one county of, uh, of New York uh, that he could see that year. And um, he, the county line was a uh, river. And he looked over on the other side of the river and he saw a black crowned night heron. And, uh, but it wasn't in the county he was in. So he ran over across the bridge and scared the black crowned night heron over across the river and then went back and documented it in his county. I thought that was sort of interesting. It seems to me that the rules ought to be that if the birder is standing in the county, that's what ought to count, <laughs> not if the bird is in the county. And so, but the rules sometimes get a little technical. And the big year record to now for the entire uh, nation is 840 species. Interesting enough, this record was set by a man who's from Australia. And uh, that's sort of an insult to American birders. And the, the big world year, the person who saw the most birds in, in the entire world was... Uh, 6,852 uh, by this fellow whose name I can't pronounce from the Netherlands. And uh, that was just in 2016. If you like the book, The Big Year, uh, there's another book that I highly recommend to you, and it's in our library. It's called Birding Without Borders, and it's by a young man, Noah Stryker, who went on a quest to see as many birds as he could in the entire world. And it's just a super read. He's a great writer, and he tells a lot of stories about how he saw some of the most unusual birds on the face of the planet. Uh, Sir, go down. Yeah. Uh, today we have a guest, uh, Mitchell Pruitt. Mitchell Pruitt is the fellow you see on the screen now. It's in, in the orange, and this is a picture of he and his dad. Uh, they were in Conway on this day, and I was birding with them. And Mitchell was trying to do a big year. He was trying to see as many birds as he could in the state of Arkansas. And he was only 16 years old and he was still in high school and his dad helped drive him around. And um, on this day, uh, we saw a Bachman Sparrow and he was telling me that this is the only time he's ever seen a Bachman Sparrow and it's the only day I've ever seen one. So that's a memorial day for uh, Mitchell and I. And, but here, this is Mitchell today. And this is how you'll normally see uh, Mitchell. I call him a rock star birder because he hit the scene as a young man and saw so many birds and he's contributed so much to birding in our state. And many people know him. He served in offices for the State Audubon Society. And uh, he's doing a lot of good work now as, um, as a student at the University of of Arkansas where he's continuing his study of birds 
and it seems like he's headed for a career uh, in academic ornithology. And uh, Pruitt is here to talk to us about his big year. And then later he's going to talk to us about um, a bird that he has a special knowledge of. Okay, Mitchell, good to, good to have you with us. Good I'm so glad. Here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Let's move it over here. There we go. <laughs> Get in the screen. So, oh, Mitchell, tell us, uh, tell us about your big year. Well, um, so the prospect of this big year in Arkansas started when Jerry came to see me in Jonesboro. We birded together during spring migration in 2010. Um, and he approached me with this prospect of uh, somebody <laughs> doing a big year. And <laughs> at first I was sort of daunted by the idea because I had definitely heard of it before. Um, but as a young birder, didn't necessarily think I was qualified for the project. Uh, I was also um, 15 or 16 at the time that I met Jerry. So just barely able to drive, which would have been severely limiting um, for someone needing to see birds across the state, potentially. Yeah. I might, you might remember, uh, Mitchell, at the time I'm, I'm a, I write about birds, some for the newspaper and, and I tried and tried to get somebody that would do a big year and I could, um, I could sort of document mm -hmm. them doing it. And then when I saw a young birder who had such a good ear for birds, I said, oh, this is my man. <laughs> and so I'd asked several people, but I, I think his mom and daddy might be mad at me for, <laughs> for involving Mitchell in, in a big year, but, but they were very supportive and he did a good job. Um, yeah, they were very supportive. Like I said, I, um, was barely able to drive at the time and still wasn't allowed to go on long trips across the state. So I, I was very reliant upon um, their support for taking off at the drop of a hat to, to go see rare birds that pop up across the state. Um, the, the first bird, as I remember, the first bird you saw was a um, Northern flicker, is that what you recall? Yeah, that's right. The first bird that I saw was a northern flicker. It was on uh, New Year's Day, so January 1st, 2011, um, and there was a northern flicker in, in the backyard of my house in Jonesboro. <laughs> yeah, and that's always been a bird that I've, I haven't thought about that in a long time, but it's no wonder I'm still so attracted to, yeah. to flickers. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a handsome bird. Yeah, it really is. And then... Um, I think it was the second day, it might have been January the 2nd, that uh, you joined me and some others, and we did a Christmas bird cam in Lone Oak. Yep, that's right. I remember I stayed, my mom and I stayed in a hotel in Little Rock the night of New Year's, and then the next morning on January 2nd, we met up bright and early. It was before the sunrise, actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, to, to do a Christmas bird count in Lone Oak County in eastern Arkansas. Do you remember any of the birds we saw on that trip? I remember American Widgeon. I think it might have been the first American Widgeon I'd ever seen. Uh -huh. That one stands out. I Lone Oak Christmas bird count historically has been one where interesting rare birds pop up, which is one of the reasons that I chose to go on that Christmas bird count. Um, we didn't see anything too unusual, but there had several years before there had been an ash-throated flycatcher on that yeah. count and maybe vermilion flycatcher, things that yeah. weren't supposed to be there. Yeah. yeah. I was there when they saw the ash throated, oh, yeah. but I missed the vermilion. And I believe we we got a good look at the um, uh, uh, great horned owl. Do you remember that? Oh, we yeah. There, we pulled into a old cemetery uh -huh. place. and at, at, That was at early in the morning. Right, yeah, very yeah, early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was cool. And we saw hundreds of thousands of snow geese. Snow geese, thousands of blackbirds of various, pretty much any species you could want to, to see in Arkansas. We saw them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, now I, I can't remember the numbers about where you were at different 
stages, mm-hmm. but I know by uh, by the end of winter, you were really looking forward to the spring migration where you could get a lot of your mm-hmm. warblers right. in. And uh, where, where did you find most of the warblers that you saw? I found most of the warblers in Northeast Arkansas, um, where I was from. I'm originally from Jonesboro. And there are several famous parks in that area that really pack in the, the warblers and other spring migrants in spring. Um, migrants that are using the Mississippi Flyway, which Jones World is sort of in the heart of that. So you have a lot of a lot of birds moving up and down the Mississippi River yeah. Valley. Yeah, because that, that was on Crowley's Ridge. On Crowley's Ridge, yep. yeah. Uh-huh. That, that's, a, that's a good birding place. Mm-hmm. Now then, I wonder if you would tell me about uh, when you saw the uh, American bittern. Did oh, you- yeah. You tell, tell, tell us the story about the American bittern. Um, American bittern was a bird that I had not seen. Like I said, I was pretty young in the birding world at this time. So a lot of the birds that I saw this year are birds that I've since seen a lot because now I know that they're more common. But but there were some like American bittern that I had never seen before. And there was a birder in Jonesboro who had seen American bitterns at this refuge in Northeast Arkansas um, called Wapanaka National Wildlife Refuge. And that's a big place for spring migrants. Uh-huh. And um, he had seen them several days in a row at this refuge and it was finally a Saturday. So I had the opportunity to go. Um, <clears throat> and my dad took me over there um, and we searched this wetland unit for for American bitterns and they're no, they're, big birds. So it's crazy that they can hide so easily, but they're very skulky. Um, And I remember telling my dad that seeing one, if it were feeling in a super skulky mood, seeing one might be just like there was a stick there or there wasn't a stick there one second. And now there was a stick there. And that's probably the bird sticking its long neck up through the, through the uh, wetland grass and, that's exactly what happened. I remember we were driving by and I had almost given up at this point. And he said, oh, there, what is that? That's a, it looks brown in the green grass. And it, it wasn't there a second ago. It looks like a stick. And sure enough, it was an American bittern. Um, and it's yeah. pretty cool. It was my first experience with that bird. Yeah, it's a neat bird to see. Uh-huh. It, it is still rarely seen. Yes. You don't, you don't yeah. see one. Yeah, they're not very Every, common no, here. Yeah. very common. And that's a, that's a good that's a good seed. So I guess uh, during that winter, you had most of the ducks that you'd seen, and then you'd seen the warblers. And and always there's some bird that's your nemesis. It, it's mm-hmm. around, but mm-hmm. you, you have a hard time seeing it. Yeah. Can you remember a particular bird that was kind of a nemesis mm-hmm. for you? trying to think. I remember we were looking for, uh, for a while, we were looking for a Townsend Solitaire. Oh, yes. And uh, they showed up for several years in a row uh-huh. up at Mount Magazine. Did you ever get to see the Solitaire? On yeah, I, I think I got it the following winter. Um, that's the good thing about needing winter birds in the big year is that you almost have two shots at it. Yeah. <laughs> once once at the beginning of the year and once at the end. Yeah. And that happened with several species. So uh-huh. I, yeah, I got the towns in solitaire, I believe, the following December. Um, and there was another bird that I remember that happened with that was something I didn't expect to show back up again the mm-hmm. next winter, um, but it did. And that was a Barrow's golden eye, which oh. is a really rare um, duck. There was one scene at Lake Dardanelle um in january 2011 i spent i went several times for various other rare gulls and whatever that showed up at lake dardanelle Mm -hmm. and never saw the barrows golden eye the same day i saw redneck grebe oh um so that was a consolation prize but still no (laughs) barrows golden eye and that was one that shows up maybe every 10 years in the state so i i figured that if I missed it in January or February, that it was, I would probably not get another chance. Yeah. And then sure enough, in December 2011, um, probably the same bird ended up in the wrong place again. 
um, at Lake Dardanelle, and I got it then. Uh -huh. I, got, I was able to get it in December. Yeah. yeah. Did you see a kitty wake? Nope. No kitty wake. Yeah. I think that was that was another weird one that I think it was the winter before I started. There had been a black legged kitty wake in Arkansas, and I didn't yeah. see it during my big year. And there's not been another one since. <laughs> no. I don't think. <laughs> I believe I saw it that year. Right? Yeah. I couldn't remember whether yeah. you caught it or not. No. And then, um, do you remember the last bird you saw? The last bird I saw. I remember it. I'm just wondering if you do. Okay. I don't know. I don't think I do. Golden Eagle. Oh, yes. Golden Eagle. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us about it. Do you remember seeing yes. that? Yes. Oh, I remember seeing the Golden Eagle. Yeah. How could I forget that, <laughs> that was the last bird? <laughs> um, yeah. There had been a Golden Eagle seen periodically in far southeast Arkansas at... Um, near Eudora, which is on the border with Louisiana. And um, Kelly Chitwood, a birder from Southern Arkansas, uh, met my dad and I down there to, to look for several things, including the Golden Eagle. And um, we went to this lake and I tried to walk out in the mud for a better look and a, was not solid. And <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm I'm in um, up to my thighs. Oh, it was dude. only it was only one thigh. It would have almost been easier if both legs had gone in, but only one leg went in, and so I was in this awkward position where I was like doing a yoga pose, and <laughs> one leg was up to the thigh, and the other leg was still on the surface, <laughs> and had a lot of trouble getting out. <laughs> yeah, but you saw the. But eagle. I saw the golden eagle. Did you get a good look at Got it? Got a good look at it. Yep. That's so right. it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was worth it. I've, I've only seen them twice in Arkansas. Yeah. It's spectacular. Yeah, it is. I'm going to see them. Well, I was wondering now, um, I noticed that in your, in your birding, uh, I, I was, I was amazed and pleased with you, Mitchell, that you, that you met a lot of birders. Did you get a lot of support from the birding community? Yes. Yeah, it was it was great. Everyone across the state really chipped in and, and helped with um, sightings, uh, letting me be the first to know things often or or lending a hand with, hey, you're not familiar with this area. So mm -hmm. come out with me when you're here and, and I'll, I'll drive you around in my car and we can go. Yeah go look at things and yeah, everybody was very generous. And Who were some of the people that you met during that year? During the, well, you obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember meeting, uh, I think I had met Karen Holiday the fall before I started my big year, but Karen Holiday from Little Rock or Montmel technically yeah. was a, was a big, um, an integral piece. Uh, Michael Lentz and Conway, um, this was, even though I would end up several years later at the University of Arkansas, it was the uh, only the second time I'd ever been to Fayetteville was during my big year. And and all the people who, who I've been running around with for years there now, I met for the first time and, and they were a really integral part as well. Yeah. yeah. Just everybody. I could list names for yeah. 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, the reason I mentioned that is because... The birding community, uh, in some ways it's small, but mm -hmm. it's growing and they're close. And although the big year is a competitive event, uh, it it's not like people uh, don't want you to win or don't yeah, support yeah. you. Uh, they, they encourage you every year. And Even I, people who, who had done big years in Arkansas before helped me. Yeah. Uh, Nichols, Kenny and LaDonna, um, the... Uh, Dennis and Pat Braddy, who now live in Arizona, um, and Dick Baxter. And some of these people's numbers I surpassed by the end of the year, and some didn't. Some I didn't, but nobody cared. Everybody no. was willing to help. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, a, it's a great camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And um, you, when you read uh, the book, The Big Year, uh, the competitive elements of it seem to be emerged more so in mm -hmm. the movie, I think, than in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's not it's not like that. It's not cutthroat. It's 
competition. It's it's supportive competition, and all of them are interested in the bird's well-being as well as the birding. Well, -being. well there there's one bird. I was wondering, did you get to see a northern sawwet owl during your big year? I did not. You did not. <laughs> well, I think that's sort of strange that that uh, you've made a big uh, push and increased the borders of our ignorance about uh, saw wet owls in the state of Arkansas. And um, Mitchell, as I haven't said, is now a, a student at the University of Arkansas and he's working on a master's thesis on the Northern saw wet owl. And, and so for our book and a bird program, that's our bird for today. And I'm going to let uh, Mitchell just sort of tell you about the northern saw wet owl. Sure. It's a bird that most of you have never seen, including me. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah, like, well, first I'll say one rule that I've always thought was a little nitpicky <laughs> about big years. And I see this, or just like, counting life birds in general. And I see this now that I've worked with saw wets and I've handled so many saw wets, but the only ones I've ever seen were the ones that I've handled or that I've done research with in some way um, are birds that I've captured. And the rule is that, and, and it goes back and forth. Some people say yes, some people say no, but the technical rule is that you're not supposed to count as a life bird, any bird that has been captured, <laughs> even if it's not in captivity. I get it for zoo animals. I get it for for birds that are in a rehab facility or something like that. But wild birds that I'm, or that anyone is handling for research, you capture it out of the wild and it's immediately gonna go back in the wild. For some reason, a lot of people consider those not countable. And I've been told before that even though I've handled almost a hundred saw wets, I still have never seen one officially and, and been <laughs> able to count it on my life list. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, I started working with saw wet owls um, in my undergrad at the University of Arkansas. I had a mentor there, Dr. Kim Smith, um, who has since passed away, unfortunately, and he was my master's advisor as well. Um, and Kim uh, was an integral part in my sort of transition from uh, just a hobby birder to more of a scientist. Um, so ornithologist, I guess. Um, and he approached me in undergrad and asked if I wanted to work with him for an honors project. Um, and he said that we would be trying to catch this bird called a northern saw wet owl um, that had only been seen in Arkansas a handful of times, um, was really rare. And um, but the caveat was that anywhere in the U.S., for some reason, that anyone had ever attempted to catch saw wets, um, they were successful, which was sort of odd. And Kim wanted to explore that in Arkansas, and he wanted to explore it with me. So I said yes. Um, at the time, this was a bird that was considered a rare winter vagrant to the state. Um, and a vagrant is just a bird that is not supposed to be there, so, which so essentially it was considered a species that would occasionally wander into Arkansas. Somebody would see it and and it, there would be a buzz in the birding world. And that was that um, it wasn't even a bird that was on my radar, really, during my big year um, because they were so rare. So this is 2014 at this point. So fast forward several years and Kim and I go out for the first time um, to a field site in near Eureka Springs in Northwest Arkansas to try to capture and band, uh, which is what scientists do. We band birds and do various other things. But the general idea is we catch them, band them and let them go. Um, and banding is it, it's like giving the bird a unique identifier. So the goal is um, for migratory birds like the sawwet owl, if it's banded in Arkansas, maybe it's captured again on its breeding ground somewhere else. And we can say, oh, it was banded in winter in Arkansas. Now it's breeding in New York or something like that. So we can get information that way. That's why we ban birds. So that's what we set out to do. Um, the very first night we were in the field, doing this work, we caught a saw wet, which was a complete shocker, sort of turned 
immediately turned everything that we thought we knew about Sawets in Arkansas upside down um, and has spiraled into a graduate career for me um, studying this species and other owls. Um, today, we know that Sawets are regular fall migrants to Arkansas. Um, so since 2014, every fall, um, I've been out in the field um, capturing and banding saw wets and studying them in various other ways. Um, and after catching almost 100 in Arkansas since 2014, we now know that they regularly migrate to Arkansas. And um, that was something that was previously unheard of. And we know also that they're very secretive. So it's kind of no wonder now that they were considered these rare vagrant um, birds to Arkansas because people were just weren't observing them. They don't make sounds really this time of year. They're very quiet. Um, if they do make a sound, it's not, it's not one of their more obvious sounds. Um, and so they were just flying under the radar. Um, so after Kim and I established that Sawwets were migrating to Arkansas, um, we set out to, to attempt to document, at least in our area, where they were going because they don't just might there there are several options they could migrate to arkansas and stay the winter they could migrate through arkansas and keep going south which would be completely unheard of for this bird because it's really considered a northern species i'm going to ask you a question mm -hmm. uh we have some images of them yes of the yes we do have some images Would let's you? show let's show some pictures so here's what i'm talking about this is a northern sawwet owl I'll scoot over so you can see my face. <laughs> and this was the very first saw wet that was captured in Arkansas by Kim and I in 2014. Um, it set very nicely for a couple of photos after we released it. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, why do they call it the northern saw wet? Is there a tropical saw wet or a southern saw wet? There's actually one other saw wet owl. Um, there are four species in the same genus, but there's only one other species that has saw wet in the name, and it's the unspotted saw wet owl. And it lives in um, southern Mexico through uh, down through Central America, through Costa Rica. And I um, noticed that this image you showed us, its eyes are yellow in this mm -hmm. in this image that I have here. It's uh, red. Is that an artifact of the camera? Or is its eyes, do they appear yellow? Was that, is that a flash? The eyes are more yellow in person. Mm -hmm. um, so even without the flash, they're they're typically more yellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although the color can vary slightly. And, and this is you holding? Yes. So in the in the other picture, I always like to show that first because <laughs> you you don't really get a context for how large or small these these owls are. Um, but this is one of the smallest species in North America. Um, and you can really see that here um, holding it. This is fast forward uh, six years to last fall, hence the, the mask. <laughs> um, and, and this is me holding one of these saw wets. So you can really get an idea for how small they are. Um, and, and once again, small, silent, secretive. It's no wonder that we thought that they were just these rare things that popped up occasionally. Now, what kind of um, habitat are you trapping? Are you uh, capturing these? So we're capturing them in um, on a trail near the parking lot of a science center in, in near Eureka Springs. So it's not a good feel for the habitat they're using because we're using something called an audio lure to attract them to the nets. So we're using a call to call them into the nets but I, that's what I was going to say, segueing into once we discovered that they were migrating to Arkansas, we sought to determine what was happening next, what they were doing. And so in the sub following years, we put radio transmitters on some of these birds um, and tracked them. And from that, we determined that not only were some individuals staying in the area for the entire winter, um, but they were using... Um, in our region, they were using upland pine forest, um, which here in Garland County, there's a lot of mm -hmm. um, upland pine forest. Um, 
and specifically pine forest that was managed for openness. So, so places where maybe there's a lot of controlled burns or thinning of the understory. So historically open forest. Well, the same places where you'd see the cockaded woodpecker would be. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Same places, especially here in Southern Arkansas, um, places where red cockaded woodpeckers are probably have wintering saw wet owls. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where we're at. This is I um, am a career grad student at this point. Okay. So I'm I'm in my PhD research and um, now, am now in your in your in your PhD and your your additional work, you've broadened out, and so you're not just looking at sawwets. You're looking at other owls as well. Right. So I'm not just looking at sawwets anymore, although they're an integral part. Um, but I'm also looking at several resident species of owls, um, barred owls. Some of you may be familiar with barred owls. They're the owl that people often say, are there monkeys in the forest behind my house? Or, <laughs> yeah, who cooks for you? Um, yes, so that's another species that I'm working with, um, not physically. I'm actually, a lot of my PhD work has to do with um, having other people send me feather samples and I'm doing some data analysis oh. on those feather samples. Yeah, so it's slightly different. Some less field work, um, more lab work, but still very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Mitchell, it's good to have you in the Book of the Bird program. Yeah, I, glad to I be here. I appreciate it uh, so much. Um, for those of you who, um, who are in the Hot Springs area, who are in, in the Hot Springs area, you tonight, uh, Mitchell is speaking at our Audubon Society. We're meeting at uh, six o'clock, well, actually, 5 30 at uh, Entergy Park here in Hot Springs. And Mitchell's going to do a full blown slideshow on his research on sawwets. And uh, we'd invite you to come to that, um, or I invite you to come to the library if the uh, via your computer, um, there are some, there are some, uh, there are some things I want to share with you about what's coming up in the book and the bird program. Um, uh, Bruce, this is a, this is a picture. I don't know, Mitchell, whether you remember this picture. Do you know whose hand that is? Is that mine? That is your hand. <laughs> And do you remember that owl? Yes, I do. And that yeah. owl is, tell, them, tell, them, tell the public about that owl. Um, I'll pop back in for a second. Yeah, so yes, on. I was a um, volunteer for a long time at the Crowley's Ridge Nature Center um, in Northeast Arkansas. It's one of the game and fish nature centers. Mm -hmm. And they had a slew of education animals, including two Eastern screech owls. Um, and this is one of those birds. Um, and these birds are, are allowed to be um, education animals because something physically is wrong with them that prevents their release back into the wild. So for example, um, this individual I think had fallen out of its nest and uh, a dog or a cat got a hold of it and it ended up in a uh, wildlife rehab center. And you can sort of see that its left eye, which probably appears on the right side of your screens, um, was was messed up and it prevented its release. So that's how I got to be an education animal. Yeah. 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 The first day I met uh, Mitchell, he showed me that. That's one of my favorite pictures of uh, Eastern Screech Owl. And, uh, uh, so I, I want to show you that and let's, let's see. Uh, but what's next on the Book and the Bird program series is... Uh, I want to remind you that if you miss our first three programs, you can find them online. Uh, there's a program about Birds of America by James Audubon, and then the Birds of the Bible. And then uh, last time we met was on the search for the Ivory Bill Woodpecker uh, by Gallagher. And that's a very interesting study. We had an interesting guest. And I want to remind you that you can come to the library and see carvings of uh, an ivory bill woodpecker, it's life size. You've never seen one flying above you, but you can at the library 
just from this week. And then the next program, we're going to be looking at the book, Where the Crawdads Sing. Where the Crawdads Sing was one of the best-selling nonfiction books in the United States for 23 weeks, I think. It was on the top 10 list, and many of you may have read it. It's a lovely story. It's about the marshes and about the birds that live in the marshes, and it's got a, an intriguing mystery story and mis murder mystery, and it'll just hold your attention. And if I warn you, don't pick it up because you can't put it down till you finish it. It's a lovely written book. And then, uh, so where the crawdads sing, when you read the crawdads sing, try to guess which would be our target bird for the book and the bird program. It talks about a lot of birds in that book. And I'm going to see if you can guess which one it is. It'll be a surprise. I guarantee you. And, uh, till we meet again to talk about the birds and the books, I'm your host, Jerry Butler, wishing you peace, birds, and good breeding. Let's see, Paul, I think that's about it. Well, we do have uh, just a few questions. I think uh, most of them will be for Mitchell here, but there may be some that you'll want to uh, contribute to as well, Jerry. So, um, first of all, uh, Jerry, after... I'm sorry, Mitchell, after Jerry approached you about doing a big year, mm -hmm. uh, did you do anything special to physically or uh, mentally prepare? Um, I don't think so. I, and maybe I should have because yeah. <laughs> I very much didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it didn't take long to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I will say this, though, when I talked to you about it, you had not read the book. Yeah, I had not read the book. book and I recommended you uh -huh. read it. And I think I recommended that your mother and daddy, yes. our daddy, read it yeah. to make sure that uh -huh. uh, it was okay with them if you did that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I didn't prepare, but <laughs> I would recommend it. <laughs> uh, what was the most challenging part of the whole experience and what was the most rewarding part? The most challenging part um, was sitting in the car for hours driving across state um, back and forth sometimes back literally sometimes back and forth. I remember um, a single weekend where I went to Texarkana to Fayetteville and halfway back to Texarkana, um, which was a lot. Uh, but the most rewarding part was getting to see so many places in the state that I had never been before um and getting to see so many interesting birds okay. what was the longest period of time you went without seeing any new birds on your list at all i don't specifically remember but i do remember um a dry spell of several months the thing about a big year is that it's very easy to rack up the species at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the season. And they come very slowly towards the end while you're, you've seen almost everything common that there is to see, and you're just waiting on rarities to pop up. Um, and definitely towards the end of the year, there were some dry spells that were weeks to, to up to a couple of months long. Yeah. Yeah. You could probably make a pretty interesting, video game like a ripoff of pokemon or something yeah. <laughs> yeah that would be fun the big year video game <laughs> um have you ever thought about uh, being involved in your own book or documentary that, that you lead on this um i have not actually um yeah i haven't i, I think uh, mitchell mitchell hadn't pro promoted himself very well i I told him some time ago that I was his press agent. <laughs> so I guess if a story is ever told about Mitchell's big year or a movie is ever made, I, I'll be the one. That'll make yeah, it. yeah, that's right. I do. I did at the time write about it and um, blog about it. And, and I continue to maintain a nature blog today. But yeah, no books published. <laughs> 
uh, what would you say um, are, let's say, the top three or four birds of interest that are must sees here in Arkansas? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to say Northern Sawwood Owl. <laughs> <laughs> um, come up to visit my field site. Everyone is always welcome to visit and maybe we'll see one. Um, I would say that's one. Um, more seriously, I think that um, our pine forests here that have been managed for a specific set of species that are in severe decline across the southeast are interesting, in particular um, red cockaded woodpecker and um, Bachman sparrow and brown headed nuthatch that all sort of live in this same ecosystem together. Um, I think they're really, I'm always drawn to pine forests and those species for some yeah. reason. It's, it's interesting. I'm a, I'm a, on a website known as Birding Pal, mm -hmm. where birders that come from other areas and they frequently ask me, can I take them out and show them a special bird? And uh, I believe brown-headed nuthatch, people ask me about that more than any really? other bird. And I I can reliably show them mm -hmm. uh, brown-headed nuthatch mm -hmm. here in Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a good bird for our area. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed the ivory billed woodpecker wasn't on your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what would you say uh, personally was the most challenging bird for you to find on your big year? Oh, I remember specifically spending a lot of time in South Arkansas looking for common ground dove, which is a dove that is like house sparrow size. So you think of a morning dove and then scale that down by like <laughs> two times um, at least. And there was a period I haven't, there really aren't as many birders in South Arkansas. So maybe I just don't hear about it, but there was a period of several years around my big year where common ground doves were pretty common in Southern Arkansas. Um, in the fall, especially in cornfields that had just been harvested. So there's corn all over the ground. Um, and that was one of the birds that I spent a frustrating amount of time searching for, eventually caught a glimpse of one, <laughs> but yeah. Now, did you see the uh, Inca dove? Yes, Inca dove was fairly easy, actually. I That was another one of my integral bird pals, Sandy Berger, who lives in Fort Smith. Um, Fort Smith has populations of Inca doves and white wing doves that are both typically considered Western species. Um, and, and I got those in her yard. In oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you both uh, had mentioned earlier how um, the camaraderie and making the connections and networking is so essential to this whole process. Really, really sounds like it. it you, you wouldn't have been able to find some of these birds without kind of a, a support system. Yeah, definitely. Um, networking through the bird world um, and and just asking for help was really integral yeah uh, so just for fun and you can both answer this if you could do a big year in any other state other than arkansas what would you choose no i would say maybe i have two things that come to mind one florida because Florida has some really interesting species, especially in South Florida um, and moving out into the Keys, um, but also Texas, because there's such a diversity of habitat in Texas. And over the years, I've really come to like it out West. So a chance to, to bird in West Texas would be, yeah, yeah would be cool. Yeah, it was, I've been fortunate that I have, I have visited every state in the union and, um, the state that I've been in that I didn't get to bird enough was the state of Maine. And because it's way up in the northeast corner and because it gets a lot of rarities, I think if I was to pick a state, uh, I believe I'd choose Maine. Maine. Yeah, that would be cool too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Nigeria, now, as you know, we have, we've had people as far away, at least as Iowa watching this, this series before. Um, but, do you, either of you have any advice for someone that would want to do a more 
locally, uh, Garland County centric one kind of specialized for our area that wasn't able to travel across the whole state. Are you asking, do I have some information about? Sure. Well, yes, I did. In general. Yeah, I would say it would be fun to choose a county. You yeah. could do that pretty economically. It mm -hmm. wouldn't take a huge investment of time. In fact, I'm considering doing a Garland County big year next year. I've probably seen 140 species in this county, but but I ought to make a push to do that. I think that would be an enjoyable thing for me to do. Yeah. And I'll, maybe somebody who's listening will do one with me. Yeah. I say go for it. I yeah. There are a lot of interesting birds that you can see locally, and I find myself, especially in Arkansas anymore, I don't really chase rarities across the state as much anymore. Um, so I think focusing more centrally on a, on a county, your home county or something would be, would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've, um, I've, here lately I've decided I'm more interested in observing a novel behavior than a different bird. Mm -hmm. uh, from the, at the last snow on the ground, I started watching the far, fox sparrows and the fox sparrows feed different in the snow than all the other sparrows. Hmm. They, but I'd never observed that pattern, yeah. and so I kind of made a little study. So I think you can just take a common bird and observe it and see if you can observe anything different about it yeah. than you've never noticed before. And that's almost as interesting as, yeah. as seeing a yeah. new bird. I agree. I I used, I think in, in a big year, you get into this, you can, you don't have to, but you, you can get into this mindset of like, you're jaded with common birds that you thought were cool at one point in time, but now you've seen so many that you're just jaded with them and use the term trash bird. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I've sworn off that term ever since my big year. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. <clears throat> well, I'm sure you could go on all day with, with stories and anecdotes, but how about you share just one, one more story with us of one of your favorite experiences finding a specific bird? Oh, since I've started studying sawwet owls, I'm pretty obsessed with finding owls wherever I go. Um, and I would say one of my coolest experiences in recent years was um, in fall of 2019, I got to attend a conference in um, Fort Collins, Colorado. And there was a long-eared owl being seen locally, which was a longtime nemesis bird of mine. They're really hard to see. Um, so I went out to this park where there had been one being seen. And as usual, when you're looking for cryptic species, you it's easy to be to to ahead to ahead of time think that, oh, this is going to be easy. It's seen here every day for the last week. It's going to be so easy. And then you get there and there's a lot of habitat and a lot of places that it can be camouflaged. And as an experienced birder, I'm still fooled by this time and again. Um, but this was one of those perfect situations where I got there, went into a row of trees where um, it had been seen. And the first tree I looked in, this owl just materialized. It was like its camouflage quit working for 30 <laughs> seconds and it materialized and there it was. Um, and that was a new life bird for me. Um, and about three minutes after I saw this owl, I heard another sound that was foreign to me. And there was a northern shrike in the next and practically the next tree over. And that was another life bird. And so that was that was my latest cool, cool experience, I guess. Yeah. That's cool. That is cool. All right. Well, we'll thank both of you for being here. Um, and Jerry for another great program, as always. Um, for everyone, if you're watching this live or in the future, um, we have a playlist that I put there in the comments for the three previous programs in the series, and this video will end up in that playlist too, um, as well as any future videos we do. So um, like Jerry said, uh, sometime in November will be the next installment in this series on where the crawdads sing. And until then, I uh, appreciate you for watching. Uh, I'll give both of our guests here an opportunity if you have any final remarks uh, or advice you'd like to share with the viewers. Birds are awesome and 
being outside and watching birds has at various times in life been very healing and soothing for me. Um, and, and I know it won't be everyone's cup of tea, but if you've never done it, I would urge you to try it because it's, it can be very relaxing. Yeah. And I would, I would in, encourage you to join us at the Audubon Society. We meet on the first uh, or the second Thursday of each month. Now with COVID going on, we don't know whether we'll be able to meet through the winter, but, uh, but uh, look at our website, Garland County Birds, and uh, keep up with the Audubon Society and join us. And we'll do a lot of things, uh, building bird houses, uh, helping pay people's way to the ecology camp, of which Mitchell went to when he was a lad. And uh, uh, let's do things to help improve uh, bird habitat and birding in Garland County. All right, well, thanks again to both of you, and thank you, everyone, for watching.